The brain size of the dinosaurs has been a topic of much discussion and estimation over the last half century. Sometimes skulls are found intact enough for a general idea of the brain case and therefore the space inside it where the brain was to be estimated. What this does not tell you is the precise nature of each section of brain that was in there, nor does it really tell you just how smart the animal was. A brand new study from a neuroscientist takes a different approach to what made the dino brains tick, and some of the findings, if backed up by her data, are extraordinary. You may have heard the sensational news that Tyrannosaurus rex had the smarts of a modern baboon. This is sensational for a reason, as it might be putting plenty of metaphorical carts before horses and counting eggs before they hatch. Even this relatively moderate description is applying too strong of a narrative in my opinion. So before I delve into my very inexperienced take on this research, and before I discuss any and all criticisms toward it by the true professionals in the relevant fields, I want to provide all information provided in the paper. What paper? Well, theropod dinosaurs had primate-like numbers of telencephalic neurons, published in the Journal of Comparative Neurology by Dr. Susanna Herculana Hossel, January of 2023. This paper was first discussed online back in mid-2022, so the subject and conclusions of the research was no big surprise to those of us in the know, but the social media buzz around it was, at least to me. Without further ado, let's delve into the meat of the paper itself. The Paper During the Mesozoic, dinosaurs were the biggest animals, so their brains were also the biggest of any group at that time. This doesn't mean they were very smart, because it's been thought for a long time that their big bodies meant their brains weren't noticeably big compared to the rest of their bodies. If they were smart, their brains would have to be much bigger, hence encephalization quotients. An encephalization quotient is the ratio between the actual brain size or mass and the brain size that can be predicted mathematically for a certain species and body mass. Calculating the encephalization quotient for a species assumes that brain size and body size are always related. Using the encephalization quotient to measure cognitive abilities assumes that brain size is always a good predictor of the number of neurons in the brain, especially in the pallium, or cerebral cortex in mammals, which is part of the brain that gives animals the most flexibility and complexity in their behavior. The problem is that both of these assumptions were thought to be true until the early 2000s. Now it's known that they are both inaccurate. Recent analyses of large data sets show that brain size and body size evolve at different rates in both mammals and birds. This means that body size is not a good way to predict brain mass for all animals. At the same time, Dr. Herculano, who sells lab, came up with a new way to investigate all of this based on an original, non-stereological way to count brain cells, the isotropic fractionator. This method made it clear that there's no one-to-one -one relationship between body mass and the number of brain neurons, not even in the structures of the brainstem that control the body. Also, there is no one-to-one -one relationship between the size of the brain structure and the number of neurons it has. 
Different clades of mammals and birds have different scaling relationships, while most reptiles have similar scaling relationships. Since there isn't a universal relationship between body mass and brain composition, and since the number of neurons, the signal processing units of circuits, should be the limiting factor that determines the computational capacity of a network, including body mass in comparisons of brain size between species of different clades, is more than just useless. It makes it harder to figure out what's going on by adding a confounding factor. Instead, the simple, absolute number of neurons in the pallium, which is organized as a cortex in mammals, is a much better indicator of cognitive abilities than the size of the brain or pallium, no matter how big the body is. These are the signal processing units that make behavior flexible and complex, so they should be a major factor in how well a system can process signals. Absolute numbers of pallial neurons are a better predictor of flexible cognitive control in birds and primates than brain mass or encephalization quotients, and they are also a great predictor of innovation rate across bird species. So, to figure out how flexible extinct taxa were in terms of behavior and thought, Dr. Herculano Husserl suggests that we need to look past the size of their brains and bodies and get a direct idea of how many neurons made up their pallium. This can be understood once the scaling relationship between the size of a species' brain and the number of neurons in that species' brain is known. According to Dr. Herculano Husserl, this makes the size of a taxa's brain a reliable proxy for the number of neurons in that clade. In particular, the number of pallial or telencephalic neurons in living species can be estimated from the size of their brains using clade-specific allometric power functions with R2 values that are usually around 0.9. These estimates are about 90% accurate. This method has allowed estimations of how many neurons were in the brains of fossil hominin and other mammal species. Now, the question comes down to, how does one figure out how fossil species were related to each other in terms of size when brain tissue has been lost? With computed tomography, or micro-CT, the brain mass of dinosaur species can be estimated from the skulls of living and extinct forms. In these cases, the number of neurons in their brains, and in particular, their telencephalons, can be estimated if the predictive equations between the number of neurons and brain mass can be found. The cerebrum, telencephalon, or end brain, is the largest part of the brain. It contains the cerebral cortex of the two cerebral hemispheres, as well as the hippocampus, basal ganglia, and olfactory bulb. Archaeosaurs, which include the archosaur grouping of dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and crocodilians, plus the archosaur sister group that contains turtles and their relatives, are all related to modern squamates, or the lizards, snakes, which are ectothermic animals. Birds are theropod dinosaurs and are therefore endothermic sauropsids, or reptiles. So the alternative hypotheses tested in this paper by Dr. Herculano Husserl are that pterosaur and dinosaur brains were constructed like ectothermic, early branching reptile brains, or that they were already constructed like modern endothermic bird brains. Dr. Herculano Husserl first had to figure out whether ectothermic or endothermic reptile scaling rules most likely applied to different dinosaur and pterosaur species. She also used the allometric scaling equations that apply to brain structures of modern early branching birds and non-avian reptiles to predict the number of neurons that made up the brains of fossil dinosaurs and pterosaurs based on their brain volumes. Using the isotropic fractionator, these allometric scaling equations show the relationship between the mass of the brain structure and the number of neurons. This method, which involves turning brains or brain structures into a homogeneous soup of floating cell nuclei, has been used on over 200 species of mammals, birds, and non-bird reptiles. Even though the resulting data set didn't separate the pallial and subpallial structures that make up the telencephalon of non-avian reptiles, it did show that the vast majority of telencephalic neurons are found in the pallium of early branching birds. 
This means that the number of telencephalic neurons in the dataset is a good approximation of the number of pallial neurons. In contrast to the recent initial analysis of the full dataset by Dr. Kristina Kurvikova and colleagues in their 2022 paper on the evolution of brain neuron numbers in amniote animals, which focused on the relationships between the number of neurons and body mass, Dr. Herculano Hussel focused on the clade-specific relationships between telencephalic and brain mass and the number of telencephalic neurons in the different clades of living avian and non-avian reptiles to find out what relationships might have applied to fossil species, which was then used to estimate the number of telencephalic neurons. As a consequence of working with neurology, I have to keep using neurological terms because there are literally no other synonyms for them, so do keep in mind the body parts to which each term refers. I'll make sure to define them as they come up. Methods Dr. Herculano Hussel had to do almost all of this research with mathematical formulas. This is bad news for those of us who don't like math or who rely on the knowledge of mathematicians when we do research like this. As seen in this table and Dr. Herculano Hussel's paper, this guy here, all of the numbers for telencephalic neurons, brain and telencephalic mass and body mass for 174 living reptiles used to figure out the scaling relationships were taken from Dr. Kurvkova and Friends 2022 paper I mentioned earlier. She used JMP16 software package to find power functions using least squares regression on values which had been turned into logs. Power functions were separately calculated for a bunch of different bird species that belong to a bunch of different groups. That essentially just means she used data from 58 birds, 88 squamates, 19 turtles, and a crocodile. The species that belong to very ancient bird groups, paleonates, fowl, waterfowl, and doves and pigeons were given extra attention as they all have the same brain scaling relationships within each group. Dr. Herculano Hussel chose not to adjust the scaling exponent for phylogenetic relatedness in the dataset. This is because the point of calculating these scaling relationships was not to study phylogeny or how related everyone was to one another, but to use the mathematical functions to make predictions for brain mass. In this case, the desired scaling relationship is the one that applies to the raw data with no changes that would change the mathematical reality of the relationships between the physical characteristics, which were the number of neurons. The absolute estimated brain mass, not just the volume of the inside of the brain box, the endocranial volume, and body mass values for fossil pterosaur and dinosaur species, as seen here in figure 2, came from four studies that had gathered estimates from CT studies of endocranial volume. Results Figure 1a of Dr. Herculano Hussel's paper showing the relationship of telencephalon mass versus neurons within the telencephalon shows that the rules for scaling neurons in the telencephalon of modern birds, gray and black, and non-avian reptiles, green, are quite different. For a similar telencephalic mass, which is found in the largest non-avian reptiles, green, and the smallest birds, black, Early branching bird clades in the data set that arose before the K-Pig boundary red, have about five times as many telencephalic neurons as non-avian reptiles. For example, the zebra finch has 55 million telencephalic neurons, but the Sudan plated lizard only has 14 million, even though both have telencephalons that weigh about 0.3 grams. Surprisingly, the numbers of telencephalic neurons in birds and non-avian reptiles don't overlap much. Dr. Herculano Hussel suspects this is the case because birds have higher oxidative rates than other reptiles, which makes endothermy or warm-bloodedness possible, rather than because of endothermy itself. Figure 1b represents the relationship of brain mass against body mass. It shows that endothermic reptiles, in this case birds, shown in red, gray, and black, have bigger brains than ectothermic reptiles, green, of the same body mass. But again, this is clade-specific, so that songbirds, parrots, and owls, black, have even bigger brains for the same body mass. 
Together, the differences between bird clades in figures 1a and 1b show that a shift to endothermy or warm-bloodedness cannot be the only cause of increased brain mass and number of telencephalic neurons in birds relative to body mass, since brain mass increases more relative to body mass in post-K-pig birds your songbirds, parrots, and owls, than in pre-K-pig birds. Importantly, these results show that birds can't be treated as a single group when comparing brain size across species and clades, as has been the norm in the field. Neuronal scaling rules are much more consistent among non-avian reptiles and for the purposes of this study, all living non-avian reptiles in the dataset, those 88 squamates, 19 turtles, and 1 crocodilian, can be considered to share the scaling rules of interest, which are clearly different from the scaling rules that apply to living pre-K-pig birds. While the number of telencephalic neurons in the brain is shown as a function of the size of the brain, it shows that within a clade, brain size is a strong predictor of the number of telencephalic neurons in a brain with a known mass, as long as the scaling rules for neurons are known. Figure 1c represents the relationship of telencephalon neurons versus brain mass. It shows that there are clearly different scaling rules for living pre-K-pig birds, red, and non-avian reptiles, green, with 95% prediction intervals that do not overlap for the whole range of brain sizes in birds. In particular, these different power laws are set up in a way that over 80% of the difference in the number of telencephalic neurons between species of non-avian reptiles and over 90% of the difference between species of pre-K-pig birds can be explained by the difference in brain mass, as long as clade identity is kept in mind. Figure 1c shows some equations that can be used to figure out how many telencephalic neurons were in the brains of dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and other fossil sauropsids, as long as these species are found to follow the scaling rules that apply to either modern pre-K-pig birds or non-avian reptiles. Using data from the literature provided in Table 1 in Dr. Herculano Hussel's paper, Figure 2 shows that the relationship between brain size and body size can be used to tell different dinosaur species apart. In paleontology or paleoneurology, and according to Dr. Herculano Hussel, it has been common to assume that a single scaling relationship works the same way for all different dinosaur clades. Figure 2a shows brain mass against body mass for sauropods, green, theropods, pink, avian theropods, red, ornithischians, blue, and pterosaurs, black. The figure shows that a highly significant single scaling relationship can be fit to the fossil species sampled with a 95% prediction interval that includes all but one species. Figure 2b uses the same parameters as Figure 2a, but in a different way. It shows that individual dinosaur and pterosaur specimens clearly follow the brain-to-body scaling rules that apply either to ectothermic or pre-K-pig endothermic living reptiles. Both Archaeopteryx, the earliest bird whose brain and body mass are known, represented by filled red circles in Figure 2b, fit the scaling relationship that applies to modern pre-K-pig birds, which evolved from Jurassic theropods and had brains much bigger than what would be expected for a modern reptile of the same body mass. Also, most theropod dinosaur species with known brain and body mass filled pink circles fit the relationship between brain and body mass that applies to modern pre-K pig birds, except for Shivuya deserti, whose brain mass is just below the prediction interval for pre-K pig birds, and Sagan mangas, with the brain mass expected for a modern ectothermic reptile of similar body mass, unfilled pink circles. On the other hand, most sauropod dinosaurs in the dataset had the same amount of brain mass a modern ectothermic reptile would have for their body mass, unfilled green circles. Depending on the species, Ornithischian, blue circles, and pterosaur, black circles, brain sizes line up with either endothermic pre-K-pig birds, filled circles, or ectothermic reptiles, open circles. The range of protoceratops, filled blue circle, was close to that of modern pre-K-pig birds, 
So comparing the brain to body mass ratios of the sampled fossil species with those of modern ectothermic and endothermic pre-K pig reptiles suggests that the neuronal scaling rules shared by modern ectothermic reptile species also applied to the telencephalon of all non-theropod fossil species of sauropsids, except for some pterosaur and ornithischian species. Figure 3a, another brain mass versus body mass plot with sauropods, theropods, avians, ornithischians, and pterosaurs shows how fossil avian and non-avian theropods had the same relationship between brain size and body size as living pre-K pig bird species, and in comparison, primates have much larger brains for a similar body mass. Figure 3a also shows that the relationship between brain size and body size for fossil sauropods, several pterosaurs, and some ornithischians is the same as for living non-avian sauropsids, even though their bodies were quite different sizes. All this is then translated into Figure 4. This chart plot of primates, bird-like sauropsids, and reptile-like sauropsids with their brain mass and neuron numbers going from small at the right to large at the left. As was generally thought of before this study, the birdie theropods have the largest number of neurons and the less birdie dinosaurs have the lower amount, though that is definitely simplifying things too much. According to this figure, the pterosaur pterodactylus was an utter dunce and Tyrannosaurus rex had similar neuron numbers to baboons. Estimating the number of neurons in the telencephalon, whose main part is the pallium, which is a big part of how flexible behavior is, is obviously important for figuring out how smart dinosaurs were, no matter how big their bodies were. According to Dr. Herculeno Hussel, estimates that top predators like Tyrannosaurus had the same number of telencephalic neurons as modern medium-sized primates with very smart brains gives us a new way to think about dinosaurs. A carnivorous bipedal dinosaur the size of an elephant with the intelligence of a macaque or baboon must have been a particularly good hunter. But Dr. Herculeno Hussel also recently showed that the number of neurons in the pallium is a true and reliable predictor of age at sexual maturity and maximum longevity in warm-blooded animals. In fact, according to Dr. Herculeno Hussel, the absolute number of neurons in the cerebral cortex can predict 74% of the variation in these life history variables in both mammals and birds, while body mass is no longer a predictor once the number of cortical neurons is taken into account. Using the reported equations, L equals e to the negative 4.939 times n of cx, 2 to the 0.402, and s equals e to the negative 2.858 times n of cx to the 0.471 power, which relate maximum longevity, L, and age at female sexual maturity, S, respectively, to numbers of cortical neurons, and assuming that most telencephalic neurons in sauropsids are pallial, Dr. Herculeno Hussel says she can predict that a warm-blooded Tyrannosaurus with 2.2 to 3.3 billion telencephalic neurons neurons would take four to five years to reach sexual maturity with a maximum lifespan of 42 to 49 years like baboons. In contrast, Dr. Herculeno Hussel says Archaeopteryx should reach sexual maturity in about eight months and have a maximum lifespan of 10 years like flycatchers and other songbirds. The survivorship pattern of tyrannosaurs is comparable to that found in long-lived mammals and birds, which supports the estimate provided by Dr. Herculeno Hussel's equations. The hypothesis that tyrannosaurs reached sexual maturity at the age of 5, just like living warm-blooded amniotes with comparable numbers of cortical neurons, is a full decade younger than previous estimates. The discovery that only 2% of the population lived long enough to attain maximal size and age for the species or genus makes the estimate of a maximal lifespan of just over 40 years compatible with the oldest known fossil. Although the estimated lifespan of the largest and oldest T-Rex was 28 years, well below Dr. Herculeno Hussel's predicted maximum longevity, the finding that only 2% of the population lived long enough to reach the species' maximum size and age makes the estimate of a maximal lifespan of just over 40 years compatible with the oldest fossil. Here's where things jump the shark and where Dr. Herculeno Hussel goes full speculative zoology on us. 
Dr. Herculeno Hussel says that larger numbers of telencephalic neurons simultaneously give brains the cognitive flexibility that can be construed as intelligence and come with increased lifetime opportunities to develop that increased biological signal processing capability into skills like using and creating tools and devising and perpetuating problem-solving processes. These traits are associated with delayed sexual maturity and longer lifespans. A population's technology and culture may be transferred and perpetuated if there are enough pallial neurons and a long enough lifespan to go along with it. This allows for the development of a body of skills that define communities. According to Dr. Galena Hussel, her research raises the possibility that theropod dinosaurs like T. rex, who had even more telencephalic neurons than corvids crows, that use and make tools today, had the biological capacity to use and make tools and create a culture similar to that of contemporary birds and primates. Thus, learning more about what went on inside dinosaurs' heads broadens the understanding of Mesozoic era life in many ways. It also elevates theropods, if not other dinosaurs, to the cognitive level of modern birds and primates that use tools and create societies. Yeah, she went there. Dr. Holtz's response. I know we just went through the thickest of papers on a topic we may not all be familiar with, but I think it would only be right to provide the response that Dr. Thomas Holtz, American vertebrate paleontologist, author, and principal lecturer at the University of Maryland's Department of Geology and Super Rad Dude, posted about this paper on Twitter. Due to the nature of this informal social media site and response, I will clean it up a bit, but provide as much of his word-for-word -word response as possible. I don't think it would be right for anyone to quite call it criticism yet. Since people have asked for it, a thread on the new paper about Tyrannosaurus and other dinosaur intelligence. Let's start off by acknowledging that no one, no one, is an expert in every field, and so mistakes and misunderstandings happen, especially when working on material outside your normal professional experience. This thread is about looking at the paper, no more. Author attempted an interesting question. Estimate the total number of neurons in the telencephalon, the part of the brain that includes cognition, among other stuff, of extinct dinosaurs. How do you get to that number? The author took the estimated brain size and body size of fossil animals based on previous studies, as well as comparable data of modern species. Then using different alternative scenarios, she estimated the entel number of neurons for the fossils. The regressions included one based on cold-blooded, extant animals and one based on endotherms. Here's where input from the paleoneurological community is important. While it is true that the two major endotherm living groups, birds and mammals, have big brains, dinos didn't. Indeed, the newer generation of paleoneurologists have worked to map out in greater detail the inferred anatomy of dino brains, their ontogenetic changes, and their diversity. So, it is up to the paleoneurology experts to let us know if the values found in the new paper are reasonable. And if not, why not? That's not my field. In any case, under the endotherm model, the estimates put big theropods with entel values in the primate range. Okay, I'm not equipped to say whether those entel values are likely, but at best, this is what the analytical portion of the paper finds. Everything else of significance about this is actually speculation based on these numbers, not actual discoveries. For instance, what does a baboon entel actually imply for the life and behavioral repertoire of a Tyrannosaurus individual? This is where we need the animal behaviorists who study modern examples to speak up. Do animals with similar entel values have similar cognition? And in particular, what role does body size play in all this? If you have an entel equivalent to a baboon, but a body the size of an African elephant, does that really mean baboon-level smarts? The author speculates on Tyrannosaurus tool use and other sophisticated behaviors on the basis of an entel estimated from one set of regression curves, which is why people should be very, very, very cautious about these conclusions. But wait, there's more. And now we run into a case where the paper's conclusion, based on theoretical speculations based on their entel estimates, are in direct conflict with actual fossil evidence, life histories. 
The paper speculates that Tyrannosaurus must have had a life history similar to modern animals with similar entel values. So, sexual maturity at 4 to 5 years old, and lifespans of 42 to 49 years. The latter is higher than found in any Tyrannosaurus so far, not impossible, but a sexually mature T-Rex at 4 to 5 years old? Although debate remains about the best curve fits for dinosaur growth curves, most of the evidence points towards small body size in Tyrannosaurus during their first decade. Even Jane is only about 11 to 13, as shown by previous work. The best evidence for onset of sexual maturity in Tyrannosaurus was about age 13 to 16, around the same time as numerous other anatomical changes. Now, the idea of sexual maturity at 4 to 5 in Tyrannosaurus is fitting a mammalian growth pattern onto a non-avian dinosaur. But considerable work has shown that dinosaurs did not have such a growth pattern. Most of the total lifespan was not as adults. And I am not discussing mortality rates here. This isn't about the fact that most of them died young. This is about the nature of the dinosaur growth curve as reconstructed by multiple researchers. This makes non-avian dinosaurs different from their extent kin. Modern birds do have the potential for, relatively speaking, long adult lives. In both the case of aves and mammalia, this may be the result of lower rates of young per clutch or birth. So, getting back to this paper, the attempt to force a mammalian life history based on a number of telencephalic neurons estimated for brain to body size doesn't match the fossil record. So I'm not saying that the paper's primary analytical conclusion, the entel values, are actually wrong. I await what the paleoneurologists say about their interpretation. I'm not saying that the behavioral conclusions are demonstrably wrong, we can't say that at this time. What I can say is that I find it hard to justify the speculations based on the data and methods used, and I await additional comments from relevant subject experts. Metamala, a paleo artist, chimed in as well. Since we're apparently all being currently entertained by the telencephalic neurons equals smarts paper, here's a couple of funny as I noticed. Stegosaurus is a real pigeon brain, 71.8 m neurons, or maybe a great tit brain of 83m. Brachiosaurus is totally as smart as a pig, 307m. Meanwhile, Protoceratops is way, way smarter, more like an emu, 439m. I guess it has to be smart to beat humans in war, despite not even having hands. There's also magpies and jackdaws, 443m and 492m respectively around this neuron count, which make Protoceratops seem even more intimidating. But let's get to a real brain powerhouse to put all of the proceeding in shame. The Greater Kudu, at 763M, which is practically as smart as a long-tailed macaque of 801M, which actually are both a bunch of dunces compared to Iguanodon. That's right, talk dumb and get the thumb. Grey parrots, 850M, capuchins, 1140M, and ravens, 1200M, ought to observe some respectful silence in the presence of this Jurassic megamind. Why, it was almost as smart as a giraffe, 1730M. Also, while baboons, 2880M, may have the upper hand on Acrocanthosaurus, it was still clearly smarter than a giraffe or a blue and yellow macaw, which was 1917M, which I think means it was good at imitating voices and riding a little mini bicycle, or a very large mini bicycle, which would be a regular sized bicycle by our standards. I do wonder about those giraffes though. Are they self aware? Do they have theory of mind? What does giraffe tool use look like? What generational knowledge do they pass down to little giraffelings? Do they spend long moonless nights wondering what would happen if they tried to swim? Also, rats, 31M, are dumber than guinea pigs at 43.5M? That's it, I'm out. For those wondering, rats are way more intelligent than guinea pigs. I, not being an expert in paleoneurology, nor what I would consider an expert even in the field of paleontology, don't want to offer much of an opinion about the contents of the paper itself. I can barely understand what I have written here for this video and took a lot of it from the paper itself for that reason. I do think it may show areas of weakness in many paleontologists. That being said though, not every paleontologist can or should have to be an expert in paleoneurology to be able to discuss this paper or what it posits. 
My main criticisms, that I think are valid, have everything to do with how the paper reads and how the data table is organized. Like, it seemed odd to me that it is that some taxa have species name attached to them and some don't. As far as I can tell by the table description, the little letters designate from which paper each measurement was taken. But like, why is it Xanabazar Jr., but then Archaeopteryx, 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 but then Archaeopteryx lithographica? Is it because the original paper did not apply a species name because they used a specimen that cannot be identified to species, so it just has a genus name? That makes the most sense to me, but then why apply a species name to any of the other entries? I'm just being a little nitpicky there. Another thing I noticed was that the author used the personal pronoun I throughout the paper, which I always thought was frowned upon even when you are a single author. That is how I was taught at university, and I don't particularly have a strong opinion one way or the other, just thought it weird enough to note. Plus, I generally agree with the true experts that the whole baboon smarts and therefore culture and tools seems a giant stretch to make from the actual results of the math. An interesting study to say the least. Just don't go around hailing it as gospel just yet. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, hit the bell icon for updates, like this video, and drop a comment in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my elephant tier patrons Arda Bayer, Biotiverse, Christoph Hubbinger, Dinosaur, Isaiah Garza, PA Brew News, Ray, Rudy Redgrave, Smiling Walrus. And another thanks to my Tyrannosaurus tier patrons, Iberospinus, Iron Bladesman, Swaffles is Weird, Teeny Dragator, The Dogman.